point at uh, EFG Hermit. I've been covering Kenya banks for almost uh, 20 years. Yes. So, Rona, I know the, the, the latest thing, one of the latest things that is uh, more, I can say, trend is inflation. Comparatively, how do you find the, our, our, our inflation? But, uh, yeah, just like in London, it does Everywhere. seem inflation is biting. Um, it's the first time I've been in Kenya for more than 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I think pump prices have, you know, nearly doubled from the last time I was here. Uh, when I walk into the supermarket, it does seem, you know, uh, items of basic commodities, bread, milk, is just a lot more expensive than my recollection of those items growing up. So, yeah, no, it, it definitely does seem to be quite prevalent and, uh, yeah, biting. Mm. Now, uh, we, we have seen a lot of interest in uh, some of the, in the Middle East and GCC countries in, in, the, in the country recently. We saw the visit by the Iranians and then we, the Saudis were also here. What do you think is uh, driving a lot of interest in Asian, Middle Eastern countries in, in Kenya especially? Because we, we have also seen that they are suggesting that we could go for a scoop bond. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, the motivation is uh, it depends on which end you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, from Kenya's perspective, they're clearly looking for uh, yeah. more investment inflows, whether it's in uh, direct portfolio inflows or uh, foreign direct investments, uh, and obviously making, you know, targeting the GCC countries makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have seen these countries make significant investments in other parts of the world. And, you know, with what Kenya has to offer, either on the infrastructure investments or other, other projects, it, you know, it, it seems like there could be interest from, 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 from those countries. Uh, from the other end, I, 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 you know, I, I understand their motivation could be just to, you know, further extend uh, their, uh, you know, this is part of their foreign policy uh, agenda in terms of increasing their influence outside of, of their of their countries, you know, getting developing more relationships outside of their traditional, um, you know, partners and and, uh, and partner states. Yeah, and we, like like I mentioned, we were uh, there, there's been talk that we are considering uh, having a scoop bond because of the success that Egypt had recently. Sure. What do you think are, are some of the prospects of so Kenya raising a scoop bond in the short term? Um. I mean, I, the, the prospects should be no different to you know, raising other types of external debt. Um, it just depends on whether the country has the ability to capacity to repay. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is based on current fundamentals, the country does have the capacity to repay. Um, and, and yeah, and so on the back of that, they should be able to, to, to raise the Sukuk. But, Obviously, things are getting quite quite uh, difficult. So the pricing of the sukuk, like the pricing of other external debt that they're raising, could be a bit more uh, expensive than than what they've uh, they would have received a few years ago. Okay. And from foreign invest uh, foreign investor perspective, in terms of there are three there are a number of key issues that will happen through the year. That is the IMF meeting and pro pro probably the possibility of getting additional funds from the program. The, like I mentioned, the G two G deal. The euro bond. How much is that of a of a concern to the investors looking into this market? I believe the IMF deal was done, wasn't it? Or the, is that the, the the board is supposed to meet next week? Sure. No, I, but I, I I believe that you know, given the comments that were made around the press release, there shouldn't be any negative surprises from the board. So I think that board approval will be given, and the funding uh, from the IMF. I think the, the additional four hundred million tranche that's come, coming through will come through and obviously that will be a positive um, signal for the country. Uh, but I, I sense the key issue right now in the short term is this G2G deal. There's very little transparency around it in terms of how the repayment for that will work and you know what impact it has on the FX market when that repayment begins. So I think that's the next sort of crucial litmus test for the country um, and I think that's something that the government needs to manage very uh, very transparently and very competitively. And, and with the Eurobond? 
so I think if they can now uh, start making repayments for this G2G deal without having to sufficiently dip into the FX reserves that they've built up over the last two months with the World Bank loan, etc., then the Eurobond becomes less of a concern because they do have the FX reserves to make repayment for that. Um, but if a large part of those reserves are used to pay down the G2G deal, then, then, then you... Yeah. And then we're, we're looking at the banking sector. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing a, a sharp rise in the interest rates in the fixed, fixed deposit market and then a lot of repricing in that, in that area. Sure. So what does that... I know you had an outlook on the banking sector before the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. how that you observed through the, uh, through the six months. What, what has changed in terms of your outlook? No, we still remain positive. Um, in the short term, we do think there are going to be some headwinds. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, interest rates have gone up. We've seen deposit rates go up. Uh, that should manifest to lower margins. We saw a bit of that in Q1 and maybe we'll see a bit more in 2Q and 3Q. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're seeing the yields on the asset side of the balance sheet also increase on the investment securities portfolio. Some of the banks have started uh, implementing the risk pricing models. Uh, they have got the approvals for that from the central bank. So as the assets are re re reprised, we think those margins should recover and then maybe expand in the medium term. So a bit of margin contraction in uh, 2Q, 3Q, and then maybe we, we see a bit more uh, 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 margin starting to recover maybe from 4Q uh, onwards. From an earnings deceleration perspective, we've seen NPLs also increase. Mm. Um, given the economic headwinds, inflation, devaluation, we do think maybe NPLs further in increase uh, from, from current levels, uh, which means more provisions. Um, that will also you know, result in slightly slower uh, loan growth. But again, as the macro picture improves going into next year, um, those, those, those provisions that the banks are making should start to moderate, and that again should feed to higher um, earnings growth. So it's a bit of a short-term deceleration before um, things pick up again. Uh, and when you look at valuations, uh, you know, banks did pretty poorly last year, and that uh, trend has continued into this year as well. So from a valuation perspective, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, pretty attractive valuations given the average price to book is significantly below uh, one times now. Yeah, and despite that, we haven't seen a lot of interest, a lot of flows from uh, foreign flows into the market to take advantage of these uh, low valuations. What do you think, it, what would it take to get more investors to come in? Just a bit more confidence around the currency, uh, mm -hmm. both in terms of the level uh, of the exchange rate and uh, more importantly, the ability to repatriate funds. Um, as we know, earlier this year, um, you know, the FX market was completely broken. We were seeing huge amount of spreads and quite a few or you know, many, many foreign clients were finding it difficult to repatriate uh, dividends or proceeds from their sales. Uh, it was taking a lot longer. Uh, the spreads they were getting were much wider than you know, previously. Um, so there was a lot of loss of confidence in the FX market. And given what has happened in other countries like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, um, uh, Nigeria, I think investors just got a bit more cautious about uh, you know, when they started seeing the red flags in, in Kenya and, and, and took flight. So I think it, for them to come back, we need a fully functioning uh, proper FX market again. Yeah, and, and there has been some s sort of goodwill from the, from the regulators to kind of move towards that. Mm -hmm. From your experience with the, with the clients, is that really happening in the market? Are we getting a more liberalized in, in terms of allowing FX to find its own level? If foreign investors are happy to, not happy, but you know, they are satisfied to see the shilling depreciate because for a very long time the shilling held steady at uh, around the 117 level, then the 120 level, and there was always this uh, perception that uh, you know the central bank was trying to hold on to a artificially um, strong currency. Uh, so you know the. There was this view that you know eventually they will run, out, they wouldn't be able to sustain that, and the shilling would come under substantial pressure. 
um, and and so that made it difficult for them, you know, to put money into the country given that there was an expected depreciation uh, in the horizon. Uh, so with the shilling now depreciated, some of that concern is easing. But I guess the question now is, has the shilling depreciated uh, by enough? Um, uh, anecdotally, it seems some foreign investors are getting a bit more uh, constructive. Um, but you know, still a few question marks around the euro bond repayment uh, of this recent government-to-government uh, -government deal. Uh, I think once they get a bit more clarity around these issues, we should see um, that confidence crystallize further and hopefully that leads to uh, unlocking of some more inflows. Yeah, we, we, saw, we have seen a lot of banks making money from the forex deals, sort of just because of the spreads uh, and all that. Do you think that will, over the, the short term, that will still be the, a strong point in where banks will make, will make money this year? Definitely in the second quarter, uh, because spreads were quite wide throughout the second quarter. Um, given the sudden, uh, um, narrowing of spreads more recently, uh, we do think trading income should moderate on the, on the back of that. But like I said, a lot, a lot now depends on how the government manages the FX situation through the rest of the year, given the government bond redemption and this G2G deal, especially on this fuel deal. You know, if the government has to start making repayments and they suddenly come back into the market looking for dollars, then then puts the currency again under pressure. Uh, you might start to see spreads widening, widening again, and uh, we're effectively back to ground zero, which obviously is not great for the country in terms of attracting inflows, but it's probably good for the banks in terms of the trading um, uh, portfolios. And we've also seen the, 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 the appreciation in the short-term rates and like and, and, and the forex market. Sure. Do we foresee a situation where the banks will move away from uh, credit to the private sector? Because it has been a bit robust through the sure. year, double digit at least. Yes. Do you see that dipping again, given the, the fact that banks are now finding it more profitable to lend to the government and just uh, yeah. trade in forex? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so we expect a bit of private sector. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, firstly, from a funding perspective, to grow the loan book, you need to grow your deposits um, because the loan to deposit ratio for the sector is relatively high. So you need to grow your deposits, but deposits are scarce, they're expensive. Uh, so it will really depend on the bank um, whether they want to chase those deposits at such expensive rates mm -hmm. and, and thereafter lend using that, those deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that, you know, could create some concerns around NPL because if you're lending at such high rates and the economy doesn't uh, recover or continues to lag, um, then you know that loan might become an NPL. So that's one consideration. And sort of uh, um, a second part of that is, um, like you rightly mentioned, if you're lending to the government risk-free at 14% uh, for one year or 17% for five years, do you really need to take a risk and lend to the private sector. Yeah. Um, that being said, um, should we really be considering government lending as risk-free uh, after the events of you know, Ghana uh, last year, mm. where they defaulted and on, on, not defaulted, but they restructured their local government debt. Um, I, I, I do think the fundamentals of Kenya are far, are stronger not far stronger, but relatively stronger than Ghana, and they shouldn't go through that route of restructuring. So, you know, the risk of a default on local currency debt is low in Kenya relative to Ghana, but it's uh, something that investors need to take into consideration as well when before, you know, plunging into more exposure to the government. A little bit more, if you can give us a little bit more, just uh, some granular analysis of what you, prospects of the banks that you cover here. You can just mention the banks that you cover, and what do you think Shh. about their the specific uh, prospects for the, for, the, for the rest of the year? Sure. Uh, so we cover four banks, uh, Equity, KCB, Co-op, and Stanbic. Uh, equity of all the four is the most interesting um, because of their aggressive expansion outside of Kenya. Um, the non-Kenya assets now contribute around 35% of total 
uh, they continue to expand quite rapidly, especially in, in the DRC. So that is the most interesting and also arguably, you know, even the most robust, because even if you see uh, the growth in Kenya slow down, like most of their peers, that growth will be supported by the growth outside of uh, Kenya. Uh, the second one is from an asset quality perspective. Again, their NPL ratio is lower than everybody else at the end of last year and in, in Q1. So again, a bit more, uh, arguably, uh, you know, the, the quality of their earnings is, is a bit more superior than, than some of their peers. Um, and and uh, I guess the the final point uh, from a, from a equity p a point of view is um, we we, we talked we talk about sorry I lost my train of thought um, we talked about asset quality uh, non Kenya operations uh, and sorry margins of the four banks you know they have been very it, it's it's very visible on what's happening on the risk pricing model. Uh, they have got their approvals last year. They have been implementing from what they tell us since Q1 this year. So we should see the effect of that come through in margins, whereas you can't say the same about KCB and Co-op because we're not sure they have re really received their approvals yet. And Stanbic, although they've received their approvals, again, it's not quite clear uh, what the impact of, of their, their implementation or what the implementation strategy is. Okay. So equity, you know, current valuations looks attractive. If we go into the next big one is KCB. Um, there, you know, the key issue really is, uh, well, there are two, two, two or three key issues. Firstly, it's on NPLs. Uh, they have one of the highest NPL ratios in the sector, especially amongst the large banks. Uh, so for, from their point of view, the, the key remains how to bring those NPLs lower. Uh, the CEO has mentioned, uh, has indicated that the NPL ratio target is 14% uh, by the end of the year, as at Q1 they, have, they worked around 17%. So it'd be paramount for them to execute on bringing that NPL ratio lower to try and regain confidence. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe, you know, with the headwinds that the economy is facing, uh, that could be a challenge. Uh, that being said, if government payments uh, starts making its payments, then that could have a positive impact on NPLs given, you know, KCB has a big exposure to this type of uh, government-related loans. Um, so that's the one key area. And then the other key area for them is consolidation. Clearly, they've acquired a few banks in the last two, three years, Rwanda, DRC, Kenya. Um, most of these businesses are really operating as standalone businesses. So it's paramount for them now to start integrating, um, at least in-country, you know, here we've seen NBK and KCB still operate separately. In Rwanda, there's still two separate brands. So they need to start at least merging internally so that we can start to see some synergy benefits coming through. So those really are the two key issues for KCB. Um, for Stanbic, uh, you know, they, for the last four or five years, they've been executing on a strategy of growing their exposure to the retail segment, reducing exposure to corporates, growing exposure to shilling denominated loans that largely has been happening they just need to continue along that uh, path and also you know we need to get a better understanding of how this risk pricing model will be implemented and what impact it has on on margins so from their point of view it's just you know more of the same uh, and then finally co-op uh, of the big of the four banks that we cover or you know generally if you look at the tier one banks they are the ones who seem to have stalled uh, in the last few years, the deposit market share has consistently been declining. You're not seeing much growth on the balance sheet. So from their perspective, we need to start, we need clear communication from management in terms of what really is the strategy of this bank and we need to start seeing execution of, of them because it seems like there's very little happening at the bank.